Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. My guest today has an incredible business pedigree. He is known globally for helping people be their best and getting the most out of teams. He is also known as a thought leader in the area of strategic thinking and how to take those big picture ideas and make them tactical and practical so that stuff actually gets done. In his work life, his client list reads like a veritable who's who. He's worked with over 300 companies, the New Zealand government, and so on. But beyond the boardroom, he's an adventurist who holds the record for rowing, listen to this, 5,000 kilometers across the Atlantic Ocean. And on top of that, he's the host of the TV show called First Crossings, which recreates some of the journeys of New Zealand's pioneers. Jamie Fitzgerald, welcome to the show. It's wonderful to have you. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me along, Jesse. Oh, mate, look, I've been looking forward to this episode and recording this conversation with you for quite a while. And your background is really eclectic. It's certainly, if I'm putting words in your mouth, please stop me, but it doesn't seem to have been a very linear career path, for want of a better word. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that says more about me and my inability to have attention to detail or focus or something. I'm not sure, but yeah, it has felt a little bit strange. I, I really love this phrase. I heard it a little while ago, and it was, the secret of success is not in predicting the future. It's creating people and teams who can thrive in a future that cannot be predicted. And so on that basis, you know, I grew up on a, a sheep station, a large sheep farm by New Zealand standards, thinking, oh, yeah, well, that's kind of me. And then suddenly I go to banking and rowing oceans and walking to the South Pole and stuff. So I guess our futures sometimes can be very much unpredictable. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's to use a well worn cliche it's the rich tapestry of life and i think that's what makes life interesting and enjoyable and and what i really love about the work that you do and the experiences you've had is there is this theme about being the best you can be that is woven through all of that so i wanted to ask you from your perspective about being the best that we can be or someone can be what does that actually mean to you i mean from a personal level what does that really mean yeah, I think that's a really good question. For me, for me personally, is like you've mentioned, some of the things I've done, the jobs I've had, the adventures and so on, they're all very different. But when we immerse ourselves into them, for me, really, I just don't want to let myself down. And I think deep down, every single one of us, we're like that. All of us, we've got different values, whether we are clear about them or not. But we just don't want to let ourselves down. I'm sure that most of your listeners, or almost all of your listeners, uh, they're listening because they want to be the best they can be and they've made the choice to learn and absorb information and so on. So yeah, peak performance, being the best we can be, call it what we like, but I think I don't want to sign up for stuff and, and do a pretty average job of it. So so that's that's probably what it's all about. And when we think about strategy or when we think about goal setting, I think it often it comes down to choices, what we say yes to and what we say no to. So if we come back to some of the day job stuff that I, I have the chance to do, it's really about helping people or teams be clearer about the deliberate choices that they get to make. Because often when we say no to something, it says more about us than when we say yes to something. So all of those sorts of things I've, I've had the chance to experience in my life and, and now I'm getting the chance to do it alongside others too. I think that's fantastic, and I'd love to just talk a little bit about the power of choice, and in fact, the power of saying no, because I really agree with what you're saying, that it's sometimes what we say no to that defines us. But in today's world, there seems to be this pressure to do it all, have it all, see it all, be it all, all that sort of stuff. What are the common challenges that you see facing teams and organizations who are yet to get that clarity and what, what does that mean for them as they go through their day-to-day business? You would have observed this lots of times in your work, I imagine. But what are the consequences of that lack of clarity? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's strategy or the, pit, or the downsides of, of no strategy down to a T. You've nailed it. So 
the risk of not having clarity? Well, first of all, when we think about what good strategy is, I think maybe that should be our starting point. So strategy is really all about choices and it's all about how do we organize ourselves to achieve an agreed objective. Or if, you, or if people watch movies and so on, if we think of Alice in Wonderland, there's the Cheshire Cat in, the Alice, in Alice in Wonderland that said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And so when we think strategy and clarity and choices, first of all, we need to know what it is we're trying to achieve. And so all of the business stuff that we've had the chance to do, it's all underpinned by some pretty solid theory that we've done around the world, looking at what are the organizations who are sustainably achieving more than their industry peers. And within dentistry, there'll be, there'll be those who are sustainably kind of doing good stuff more so than, their, than your peers. And that may be despite some dentists within the practice coming and going and yet some practices are doing some really good stuff and so we've looked at that all around the world and from a strategy point of view there are some things that are consistent and these great organizations they all have clarity and alignment on the value they create so purpose and goals where to play and how to win so their business model the logic of how they do business what they focus on so their top challenges and priorities and then how they're going to maintain momentum or make it stick. And so academics would call that the operating model. So the cool thing, and this is what you talked about before, is if you've got clarity and alignment, clarity enables decision making. So clarity on what is your purpose, what's your goal, what's your business model, who, who are your target markets. By definition, having clarity on that stuff also means what you can say no to. Clarity on what your focus is or what your top challenges are means that when some opportunities or someone suggests we put resource into something else in the business, well, if you've got clarity in what your top challenges were, then you can now say, well, no, I'm not going to do that other thing. So, so this is really exciting. And, and alignment, I mentioned clarity and alignment. Alignment is not the same as agreement. Alignment within these organizations that we've seen is that they embrace curiosity, they embrace the diversity of thinking, but alignment is that we fundamentally believe that we're kind of heading in the same direction. Or, or what came up the other day with a group was that they, out of the workshop, they said, look, what we want is 90% agreement, but 100% commitment. I thought that was pretty cool. That's really good, isn't it? Because it allows people to express themselves. It allows people to have a dissenting point of view. But once that point of view is being expressed... We, we fall in and we're all moving in the same direction. Yeah, big time. Actually, do it. So, cool story. So, rowing across the ocean. <laughs> I, I felt a bit silly when you said the world record because not that many people do it. So, it's kind of an easy record to get in some ways. Yeah, well, um, well, yes and but... <laughs> no. Yes and no. Because maybe not that many people attempt it, but I'm sure there's not many people that complete it either. So, and so I think yeah, kudos where it's due. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the race happens every two years. And you mentioned that some people, it's a pretty hard thing to do. Getting to the start line is often the hardest part of any of these, you know, big adventures just because of the sponsorship and all of that kind of thing. But there was this one, so we talk about clarity and alignment. I, I love this story. So there was this one crew. Well, first of all, when you row across the ocean, there's a couple of things you need to figure out. So it's the Atlantic Ocean. So it's pretty much from Africa to America or from the Canary Islands to Barbados. And so when you row across, there's a couple of things you need to figure out. The first is, how much rowing do you do? And there's typically two of you on the boat. And the second choice is, what direction do you row? The first question, back to how much rowing do you do, typically it's two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off. So when, let's say, you and I were rowing, you'd be rowing for a couple of hours and I'd sleep, and then we'd swap over. So every minute of the day, one of us rows. And that's kind of how it normally works. The next question, though, is, well, what direction do you, do you row? Because you've got a couple of choices. The first one is that you row straight west. It's a straight line at the shortest distance. That's cool. But the second option is that from the start line, you row south from the Canary Islands, so down off the coast of Africa, because that's where the currents go. You then sweep around, and then you end up rowing slightly north off the east coast of South America because the currents go that way. So you row further, but you definitely row faster. So you've got this kind of fundamental difference, west or south, really. So anyway, we talk about alignment and, and goals and strategy. Well, during our race, there were about 18 other crews that 
we, I say we because it was this guy, a mate of mine, Kevin Bigger and I, we were rowing and that was fine. But on one of the other crews that we competed against, this is a, this is a true story. So about 6 a.m. on day seven, a week into the race, one of these guys, they were, the, they were best mates, these two guys, one of these guys at 6 a.m. comes out of the cabin after his little sleep and he says to the other guy, how's it going? How's your race? How's your shift been? How far have you gone? And the other guy says, oh, I've had a guts full. I want to quit. Now, they're only a week into the race. And the first guy says, I don't understand. We've trained so hard on the rowing machines. We built the boat. And this other guy then turned around and, and said to him, yeah, we've, we've done all of that. I can't believe how much effort we've put in. You know, every 24 hours or every 36 hours, a little signal goes from every crew up to the headquarters of the race, and we find out where we are in the field, in the fleet. And he, he, he went on to say, look, I've been rowing as fast as I can west during my two-hour shift. Oh, no. But we get the information, and we're toward the back of the fleet. Okay, so, you know, let's let that sink in for a minute. It's 6 a.m. a week into the race. The other guy who's just had his sleep just spends a moment thinking about that. He then turns to him and he says, which way did you just say you were rowing? For the first whole week, west for two hours, south for two hours, west for two hours, south for two hours. So it was just ridiculous. These two guys, they had a, I don't know what the terminology is in some dentist practices, but these two guys had a courageous conversation. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, indeed they and, did. And the, they had this massive argument. They I don't, they probably had a fist fight or something. They had to figure out which way they were going to row. And there was logic to rowing either way, right? So then you've got to, well, how do you decide? They could have flipped a coin or paper, scissors, rock or whatever. A compromise would have probably been southwest, but they didn't do that either. What they ended up doing, this is the craziest thing, one of them said, you're an idiot, I'm carrying on rowing west. And the other guy said, you're an idiot, I'm carrying on rowing south. And so oh my for the God. next week, for the next week, they kept on going, two hours on, two hours off, in their own direction. And I think for me, that just perfectly illustrates it's just that whole alignment word, or at least we, we might think that we've got the same goal, but we need clarity on at least how we're going to get there. They, weren't, they were trying, these guys. They were putting heaps of effort in. Actually, of the 19 crews that completed the race, we, did, we, well, we won that one, but they, they didn't do so well, those two guys. There was only one crew that I think they were faster than, and it was a mother and son combination who had the time of their lives and they celebrated every sunset with gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> That's too easy in style, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, it's, yeah, I was sometimes envious, envious of that mother and son combo. Oh, I think that's fantastic. Well, it's an interesting thing, though, isn't it? Because if you've got one rowing south, one rowing west, clearly, apart from the, the obvious personal friction between the two crew members, and apart from the obvious slowing down of the results, it's that feeling of wasted effort and the oh. frustration and the and that happens in business all the time, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I, until I found out about that story, we've all heard about the, the phrase rowing in the same direction. But until I, I never realized just you, you can realize you're not rowing in the same direction as others. But to then deliberately carrying on, yes. carry on not doing that, I just thought that was just unbelievable. But you're right. You are right. It does happen. And we kind of sense it and we see it all around us. Just to, I guess, to wrap up that, that sort of story, I was talking to this mate, Kevin, a little while ago. And Kevin is amazing at doing the research for some of these adventures that he and I team up for. And he found out about this other crew where these two best friends, these two guys from the UK, they were doing the race together. And mid-ocean, one of these two guys turned to his best friend on the boat and he said the word, about your wife and I. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Oh, I know. I couldn't believe it. Oh, it's brilliant. So, <laughs> oh, I, don't, I'm, I don't think those two guys finished the race together. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're in single skulls after that, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. that's yeah. hilarious. So I wanted just to talk about that, though, because that, that story of crossing the Atlantic 5,000 kilometres is an epic row. 
And apart from the alignment, a part of the clarity and apart from the goal, what I'd like to ask about you and, and your team member is what did you discover about yourselves as you went on that journey? Because that's a tough row. You would have had to have dug deep. I'm sure there were obstacles and, and setbacks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. There's a couple of things that probably keep coming up when I reflect back on any of these, on any of these big, long trips. I'll talk about the ocean. Some of the others, though, up in the Arctic or at the South Pole, they take months and months. But for this one, is, is a, the similar things would be when you look back on the big journey, I, I realised just how much I appreciated the days where there were no dramas. The race itself across the ocean Every minute was precious to us. And so, and the whole race took 40 days. And so you end up appreciating the days where you're not having to firefight stuff or, or all of the planning that you're doing, all of the conversation, the culture, the, the vibe on the boat is, is trying to focus all about progress towards the goal or to eliminate the things that might hold us up. And that might sound like a kind of a simple thing. When you're in the middle of the ocean, you end up getting sleep deprived. We're probably living on maybe the longest I slept for, I think, was about 45 minutes at a time. So even the smallest of things like where you store your food or how long it takes to quickly jump overboard to scrub the hull that you do that every five days, or even if you if one of the wheels on, on the, the seat that you're sliding up and down on, if, if, it, if something happens there, you realize that it can really catch you out and it can chew up minutes in the day. And when you're writing your diary or you're trying to do a video diary at the end of each day, those things that, that start really bugging you. And so as we all kind of pursue our own goals, it keeps reminding me back, reminding me of the importance of preparation and kind of getting ahead of things before they turn into a real disaster. So I've, as a personal personality trait, I guess I've become far more proactive nowadays in any of the campaigns I do than perhaps what I would have been previously. Yeah, and so I'm guessing part of that proactivity then comes back to risk management, risk mitigation and so on as well. Yeah, on that I was listening to one of your previous podcasts where you are talking about risks. I thought it was great. We had to apply some of the same, very same things in any of these, in any of these campaigns. And just like any business, can you completely remove the risk can you reduce the risk can you mitigate the risk before we went to the south pole for example we kind of came up with a list of all the potential scenarios that could happen down there from the very very big things to which is kind of death which is kind of bad but to the very very minor things which might just be a slower distance traveled or or anything so we had to come up with all of the plans of you know, we're going to address all of that so it's almost there's that phrase, if you don't know what you stand for, you'll fall for anything. When it came to some of these campaigns, we, because we were wanting to be the first Kiwis to walk to the South Pole unaided and unresupplied. And so the belief that we had for that was that getting to the start line had to be the hardest challenge. Now, there were plenty of challenges down there, and I lost about 30 kilos of dragging a big heavy sled. You know, it, it's, it's a tough old thing, but we knew that... Get, relentless preparation beforehand was going to save us a whole lot of anguish later on and that yeah so that's probably something that I've I didn't have burnt into my personality maybe when I was younger which I probably do now yeah fantastic <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised after trekking down there I want to take you back to alignment because I know you've got a, a background in in rowing as well in not, not so much ocean rowing but eights and fours and so on and in my schoolboy days, when I was much skinnier, I used to coxinate. And I remember the feeling of when everything was in sync and it was silky smooth. It was not quite effortless, but it felt in harmony. Can you tell me how you feel when you row and you felt that sense of harmony and alignment? And then how do you create that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. If I knew the perfect answer, perhaps perhaps I'd still be rowing with, with, with a lot more success. I mean, there's a, the awesome foursome and Stephen Redgrave and so on. There have been rowers that have probably had that knack or been able to apply it to more strokes more often than other rowers, which is probably the, the trick. But I think when you talk about the harmony and 
and as you perfectly mentioned, when you were coxing or when anyone's rowing, you can absolutely tell when things are feeling right. And if it's not quite right, you can very just as easily feel that. And in a, in a rowing boat, it's a real physical thing. You feel it kind of, you know, with the, the boat being unbalanced and stuff like that. But in business, we still have that vibe as well. And, and the likes of, there's been no shortage of theory and, and authors that have done studies on that. And, and in any of your listeners, in their businesses too, there'll be some days or there'll be some months where they feel, you know what, things just click. And I think there's that, that framework around flow or, or harmony, you know, where, we, where there's the perfect balance between progress, challenge, mastery, and all of those good things. To be able to get there or, or to achieve it, I think the clarity and alignment is it comes to the front again. So first of all, if we, if we have flow, well, it needs to be flow towards something. A lot of organizations, they fail to meet the potential of their strategy, not because it's a really stink strategy, but because not people or teams within the business don't understand what their contribution is to the strategy. And so if we go to the rowing eight example, do I absolutely know where I fit within the boat, why it's important? Do I know what we're trying to achieve? Okay, I know that we're trying to win the race or the regatta coming up. But do I know what we're trying to achieve in this training session? And do I know what we're trying to achieve by doing whatever we're doing in those three, four, five minutes on that exercise session? But on a personal level, do I know what my plan is to become a better rower and what parts of my technique I need to improve? Now, whether that's around the catch or at the finish or my leg drive or anything else. And so if there's, I'd probably say in a rowing eight, there's actually kind of 10 plus rowers because there's the eight plus the cox and the nine, the boat itself. We used to think of the boat as part of the crew that has to do its job and then the coach and things. But does every person absolutely know how their contribution matters? And then you get to kind of talk about, well, how have I made, how have I done my session today? And are we all kind of heading in the same direction? So, and that's where the different team kind of conversations need to come into play. But, you know, if it was a really easy thing, you know, everyone would be doing it, right? Exactly. Exactly right. I, I really love I love that metaphor from rowing. And I was looking at your website and, you know, the whole concept of will it make the boat go faster, which is I think is another really good phrase to think about. And I guess coming back to business, we're talking metaphors, of course, but in your experience around from a business perspective, what are the things that, yes, clarity and alignment – we get that, but what else makes the boat go faster from the business perspective in all the work that you've done? Yeah, well, I'm pleased that you've mentioned that. So, if, okay, so let's put our business hats on. So if I was to describe what an organization is, or if we were to try and define what an organization is, I would simply say that it's a group of people that come together to create value for another group of people. So first of all, we need to know who that other group of people is. So who are we actively chasing down a lot of people aren't super clear on who their customer is or who the consumer is so we need to be clear on who that is and then we need to very importantly understand well what is the value that we're creating for them so this is a conversation around value propositions and so on so it's far more deeper than just what are the products or services from a dentistry point of view okay well we might be helping with fillings or root canals and things like that that's about my limit of dentistry sorry uh, <laughs> uh, but but actually that's just the, that's just the product right the the value is what is it personal pride is it education is it hygiene is it lower insurance is it is it a better sense of family because we're a healthier family so what is the fundamental value if, if that's the basis of what an organization is when we talk about making the boat go faster, it, everything has to link back to, is it helping create that value or is it inhibiting us from creating that value? Now, the making the boat go faster coming terminology originated really back with the Team New Zealand in 1995 with Sir Peter Blake saying, if you're in sponsorship, if you're in sale making, if you're in nutrition, it doesn't, if you're in design, if you're in PR, whatever, is your contribution today, is that going to make the boat go faster? Because if it's not, then why are we doing it? And a couple of other big examples, say Visa, for example, in terms of their corporate strategy, they also 
took on a similar stance. So their focus was around making Visa go faster. Now, you might think, oh, they've just kind of ripped off Team New Zealand. But actually, it makes a lot of sense if we think about payment services, transactions, pay wave. That's about making seamless customer or consumer experiences at the point of sale. So yeah, for any of your listeners, I'd encourage them to say, to ask themselves, look, what is the fundamental value that they're trying to create? And then any activity within the organization, is it creating or adding to that value or isn't it? And there's no shortage of methodologies out there that are designed for that. For example, lean thinking. Lean thinking originated with Toyota in Japan, and it's and it is absolutely all about creating value or it's all about customer value and so if if something is happening where it's not creating customer value let's strip it out time space you know rubbish resources anything so i think that for me would be the the kind of biggest tip there and that for all of the strategy work we've we've always done with with groups or government agencies or corporates or whatever it's always been well what what are we here to achieve what's the value we're creating and then how do we wrap the whole company about it and get rid of everything else and that's not intended to be a cost-cutting exercise because the, the downside is that people think that it is, but actually you might be stripping value out by having that mindset of stripping cost out as well. And I think that's a really important point because one of the things you've really, I think, touched on, I think very, very elegantly, and it ties back into what you spoke earlier about what you say no to as much as anything is important because that can be saying no to things are going to slow the boat down. But I think what I'm really appreciating about that metaphor and how you've explained it is the simplicity striving for some simplicity in that striving for the essence of what you're doing without layering more and more complexity into it now yes of course we've got to have enough detail to make it work but my experience and jamie i'm i'm happy if you disagree or agree with me but my experience is sometimes there's this risk of over complicating things and it does slow us down yeah, I think that when somebody, what, what's the expression? When somebody can't tell a short story, they tell a long one, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to get caught up in, in jargon, terminology, theory, frameworks, and, and things like that. I think when it boils down, to, so I agree with you. I think from a very human point of view, we all just want to be the best we can be, and we've touched on that. But really, it just comes down to some simple questions like, what are we aiming for? How will we get there? How are we going to work together? How will we measure progress? And, you know, are we getting smarter along the way? Are we still on the right track? And if every person or every every team in, in an organization can kind of have similar to, uh, answers to each of those questions, I reckon you're on a pretty good track. I reckon you are too. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've just joined the show now, we are having a conversation with Jamie Fitzgerald. You can find him at inspiringperformance.co.nz. And we've been talking all about getting organizational clarity and alignment and all that goes around that. Jamie, I do want to just talk a little bit about leadership because being able to build a team is fundamentally important, but also being able to lead that team is just as important. In your experience as an adventurer, as a sports person, as a business person, what common traits or threads have you seen that come up again and again in the leaders who do it well? Yeah, well, in New Zealand, I'm sure in Australia this isn't the, uh, this isn't the case, but in New Zealand, we're kind of short of decent leaders. I think the research shows that. Yeah, I think we're, we're really we're searching for more. So if you've got any over there please send them our way uh, i think i think we've probably got a bit of a shortage somewhere in Canberra too <laughs> mate i can tell you that but maybe i should have prefaced that with with what i mean by leadership when in all of the experience that personally I've, I've had working in teams with other people and and maybe with the, the companies i've seen now i would define leadership as inspiring others toward a shared goal or purpose and then by contrast i'd think of management as our ability man- to manipulate a set of known resources to achieve an expected result. So known resources being people, time, money, things like that. And so for leadership, we're going to inspire others toward a shared goal. That may include having to go through change. It may, having, may have to 
includes saying no to some big things or pull people up or find that balance between push and pull when building culture or, or setting direction. But it's a tough old thing to do because it means that it can feel lonely when you're trying to get momentum on the side of, of your team. When I talk about it being around inspiring others toward a shared goal, it also, by definition then, the word shared means that others have to have bought into it and and you have a coalition of the willing or, or something. And so that can be a pretty tough ask as well. And then it requires bravery because you're having to deliberately perhaps move into the unknown as you chase down this shared goal. And that might come with, you might see different responses to change by others and there may be cynics, there may be critics and and you might feel, yeah, you might feel a little bit, they might be daunting. By contrast, management at least is perhaps an easier default for a lot of people because they there's more consensus, there's more structured meetings. It's just about perhaps there's more logic or rational thinking that can be put into the mix because you're applying some sort of formula to every decision. So I, so I think I've had the privilege of, of working with some, some incredible leaders and I've had the opportunity to learn from situations where perhaps greater leadership could have been shown. And, that, and in some of those cases, that was probably, probably my fault. <laughs> so, so that, but that's okay too. We all, we all learn. So I think those, those things would be would stand out for me. Is there a shared goal, first of all, or, or could there be a shared goal of what the future, we want the future to look like? And then what is our ability to inspire others toward that? And that does not mean it's just singing, we are the world or happy clappy kind of messages. That's about really getting people's buy-in to, to, for them to want to get there as well. And then the management has its place too for making it, making it happen. But for me, that yeah, that's always been what I've asked myself. Yeah, I think it's again a really good point. Look, just this is going to sound a little bit perhaps off track to an extent, but one of the things that we as Australians observe about New Zealanders, and I mean this very genuinely, is that for a small country, and Australia is a small country too, but New Zealand's smaller again. New Zealanders really do punch above their weight in terms of achievement whether it's the sporting fields, the business fields, and so on. And so something's going really well in New Zealand, I think, anyway. When it comes to the Bledisloe Cup, you know, Australians just kind of... <laughs> we just can't even watch the TV anymore. It's at that point where... And, and I think this is quite quite interesting because when you lose to New Zealand so regularly, I think Australian rugby is on the decline because we're just so sick of getting beaten. Yeah. Funnily enough, though, I've got a couple of daughters and both of them are, are loving their netball. And so uh, on one hand, the Bledisloe Cup's been great, but in my house, the Constellation Cup between the Australian team and the New Zealand team, that's been a pretty one-sided affair. And thanks to, for a moment just recently, we thought that we might have been able to have half a, uh, half a hand on this cup and, and get it back off you guys over there. But no, you, you came back and taught us a very strong lesson of, of how to play netball. So my girls were going through the grief curve not too long ago, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, I think all of us who follow rugby here are still on that grief curve, mate. I can, I can assure you. <laughs> Jamie, you've been really generous with your time, and I'm tremendously grateful to you for not just the, the wisdom and the content that is so rich and so meaningful and laden with wisdom, I'm really grateful for the stories you've told to bring that content to life. But I do have I do have something I want to ask you before we wrap up. And, and, and my question really comes back to around adventure because adventure has been a huge part of your life. And as I mentioned in the introduction, the, the theme of being your best seems to have shown up in every element of your life, whether it's been your, your finance career, whether it's been your rowing, whether it's been adventuring, TV presenting and so on. What is it around the pioneers the journeys that you're recreating, what is it around that pioneering spirit that really seems to inspire you? So when we think adventure, I would, I, the way I think about it is that it's simply about your ability to place yourself in an environment that feels unfamiliar and requires a level of preparation for you to do so. And so 
in those pioneers, the TV show, of which many of them were Australians who came over for, you know, surveying and, and discovery of gold and, and things like that. So a lot of, and it's been on SBS and, and things, the show as well. So that, that concept of putting ourselves in unfamiliar environments, a hundred years ago, these, these surveyors or other explorers, that's just mind boggling, thinking of what they put themselves through. But that doesn't mean to say that we can't pioneer our, our own path. And I'll give you an example. I walked the length of New Zealand a few years ago along a trail with a whole lot of at-risk teenagers. And we were having learning-based kind of different activities. We were mountain biking, caving, climbing, you know, shearing sheep, milking cows as we traveled the country. And it was great. Every 100 k's, a different group kind of kept popping in. And then at the end of it, we flew or bus all these kids into Wellington, the capital, and we spent a couple of days at Parliament with the Prime Minister and others. But the thing about this adventure, when I come back to it, it's about putting yourself in unfamiliar environments. For some of these young Kiwis, milking cows were was an incredibly unfamiliar environment. Or because of my finance background working with a bank, you know, we went in and into one of these branches and, and as a group we changed all of the cash in the ATM. So we were we had four hundred K worth of twenty dollar and fifty dollar notes and we're having to put it into the ATM. I mean, that was amazing. And so this learning the skills or having an experience and requiring or learning some knowledge about how to thrive in those unfamiliar environments. You know, that was a real adventure for those young people. And for me, that's why I think I've bounced from what was my first business, a farm fencing business, through to rowing, through to banking, through to maybe strategy and, and other export type stuff now. And and so I love that sense of adventure of going into an unfamiliar environment. But what's become clear is that there are some consistent things. And we've talked about clarity today. We've talked about alignment today. We've talked about having clear, understood goals of how each of our contribution fits with the goal or with the target. All of those things, they're all similar. It just turns out that I've had the chance to do it in a few different industries. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Uh, Jamie, as I said earlier, you've been incredibly generous with your time and your knowledge, and I, I appreciate it very deeply. You've been a tremendous guest, and from all of us here at the Savvy Dentist Podcast, I really thank you. For people who want to find out more about Jamie's work, please do head across to inspiringperformance.co.newzealand or .nz and check out his stuff there because there's some really cool things there, some great videos, some great blog articles, and I'd really encourage everyone to check it out. Mate, thank you. I really mean it. It's tremendous. No, fantastic. Keep it up, Jesse. And next time I'm going to visit the dentist here in New Zealand, I'm going to be looking a whole lot closer because looking at what you've been doing for people over there, I'm going to hit the bars raised. The bars gone up. I expect more from my dentist now. Oh, well, you're very kind. Thank you, mate. <laughs> All right, cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green. For more free tools and resources, join the free Facebook group. Visit drjessiegreen.com slash Facebook. And for more episodes, visit drjessiegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist.